Uh, okay, hello everybody. It is noon time, so it is time for our uh, lecture today. Uh, I'm very happy to continue with our virtual lecture series, and we have another excellent speaker for today's seminar, uh, Professor Peter Maurer. Peter, do, do I correctly pronounce your last name? Uh, pre pre pretty good, pretty good, actually. Maurer. But, uh, Maurer. Maurer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, let me introduce Peter. So Peter Maur Maurer is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago, where he investigates new quantum sensing platforms and their application to probe physical properties of biological processes with nanoscale resolution. Prior to this appointment, Peter completed a postdoctoral training with Stephen Chu at Stanford, where he developed ultra small cathode luminescent nanoparticles based on lensonides that enable multicolor electron microscopy. And prior to that, he did his PhD with Mikhail Lukin at Harvard where, among other things, Peter developed the first diamond-based nanoscale thermometer. The scientific challenges that Peter's lab uh, is addressing at the University of Chicago fall uh, uh, into two distinct yet synergetic areas. The first one is um, what are the sensitivity limits of nanoscale quantum sensors in a noisy environment? And can we engineer qubit sensors and sensing protocols that overcome these limitations? And second area answers the question, how can we interface these qubit sensors with biological systems? And what are the specific biological questions that we can address with this uh, quantum sensing approaches? So today, Peter will touch upon both thrust area he is working with. Uh, Peter, the stage is yours. Hey, great. Thank you very much, Olga, for the nice introduction and for organizing this uh, amazing um, uh, seminar series. Uh, yeah, I think diamond is, uh, is, is a great area where I think there is really a lot of opportunities for companies and uh, academic labs to work together. And I think some of the findings that we've been, um, and processes that we've been developed in my lab actually uh, could be relevant also to kind of a larger industry community. So the talk that I'm going to be today, I would like it to be a fairly informal seminar. If you have any questions about what I'm presenting or want to discuss anything in more detail, just interrupt me. Uh, I'm not sure how good I am with the hand raising uh, function on Zoom. You can also just speak up and I'd be happy to, uh, to initiate the discussion at any, any point. So yeah, what I was uh, preparing today is kind of addressing one of the uh, challenges that people have been facing in uh, nanoscale uh, uh, quantum sensing for bio application. And that's basically how can we interface kind of uh, um, a, a very sensitive but fragile uh, qubit sensor with a biological uh, uh, system that is also fragile in its own right and what could be eventually kind of applications that could uh, come out of this. And so uh, for this, let me give kind of a brief motivation of uh, what kind of motivates uh, me to do this research. So I'm by training, as Olga mentioned, a physicist. My background is in quantum engineering. And usually quantum engineering is kind of rather simple, right? You can with a, a pencil and a paper kind of write down your Hamiltonian and understand pretty well what's going on. Uh, on in your uh, quantum system, uh, at least if you have a good model. However, biological uh, systems, they are kind of the exact opposite. Uh, often we kind of lack uh, a theory to understand how kind of the complex function of life is uh, uh, where that's originating from. And if we try to understand this, uh, what it really boils down to is kind of understanding 
uh, processes at the level of individual biomolecules and interaction at the level of individual biomolecules. And that's actually a very daunting uh, challenge that has kind of uh, been uh, the main focus of molecular biologists, biophysicists, and life sciences in general. And so uh, just to give you an idea of kind of the scale we are talking about here is uh, I am showing this electromicrograph of a bacteria cell. And if you were to zoom in into a 100 by 100 nanometer area of this uh, cell, what you would find is kind of this complex soup of uh, uh, proteins, uh, RNA molecules, and lipids floating around and interacting with each other uh, a kind of a nanometer or 10 nanometer length scale. And it's really the interaction between individual uh, proteins in the soup that kind of make uh, the complexity yeah, and the function of life. Yeah? Okay, I think that may have been an accidental, <laughs> somebody not muted. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, it kind of uh, comes at, uh, at not a surprise that uh, uh, measuring kind of an ensemble, uh, uh, an average of all these molecules really does not give you the same information as probing individual molecules. And so, uh, to give an example of this, I uh, uh, like this uh, specific example of uh, basically uh, this Grand Slam tournament. And so, uh, typically, uh, a cell has 20,000 different type of proteins. And so if you would want to understand the function of a, a single protein, if you measure those 20,000 proteins and average over it, you will get very little information. So it's kind of the same thing as if you try to understand the rules of tennis and you attend this uh, tennis match that has about uh, 20,000 uh, people in their audience, and you would perform an average measurement of what people do at the tennis match, you will kind of conclude that tennis is a rather uh, in a low activity uh, sport where that consists of sitting in a chair and clapping your hands once in a while. However, if you have the ability and the technology to zoom in, in onto an individual uh, particle or an individual person, you can actually find that tennis is a game with a very complex set of rules and indeed requires um, a high level of activity. And so it doesn't come uh, at the surprise that kind of uh, the development of new tools that can allow us to probe individual molecules uh, has had um, a fundamental it changed our understanding of biology and it has had uh, it has led to kind of important insights on understanding protein uh, conformation, uh, change protein interactions, gene expression, and molecular motors. And so uh, accessing kind of um, biological processes at the level of individual uh, molecules has been a challenge. And it has gone hand in hand with the development of uh, new technologies that allow us to uh, uh, probe individual uh, molecules. And uh, that's really uh, has been one of the main driving force for biophysicists. And I'm showing here uh, four out of a, a larger array of different uh, technologies that physicists have uh, developed to study uh, biological molecules at the level of individual uh, particles. And so the first technology that was developed is kind of the single ion channel recording where people uh, measure kind of the current flowing through an individual ion channel. And then uh, uh, people started to use optical tweezers to measure force constants of uh, DNA and uh, uh, protein molecules. And then more recently, uh, people have uh, developed optical microscopy techniques that allow us to determine the position uh, of individual molecules with nanometer accuracy and cryo-electron microscopy that has really revolutionized our understanding of uh, uh, the structure and uh, uh, shapes and function of uh, molecules. So each of these technology has been uh, profound to the life sciences. Uh, each of these technology has actually been awarded individually with a Nobel Prize, uh, three of these four technologies actually in the last 10 years. However, all of these technologies are actually relying on uh, classical aspects of uh, physics. So you can understand this all with either knowledge of uh, uh, kind of Jackson level electrodynamics or uh, 
uh, uh, Newton mechanics in, in this case. Okay, so however, we know from uh, our daily life that actually quantum measurement can allow you to perform many orders of magnitude more uh, precise measurements. In fact, uh, I would like to make the argument that actually uh, all, most if not all of the uh, world's most precise measurements are actually nowadays relying on uh, measuring quantum interference. So to just give an, 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 an example, uh, timekeeping is a, is a very good example because it has been uh, technologically very relevant. If you can measure uh, time very precisely, you can determine the position of where your ship is on, on the globe. And with that, you can kind of uh, start trading around the world. And so that has led um, European countries, mainly uh, England and France, to develop very high precision uh, mechanical oscillators that allow to uh, uh, perform um, time measurements. And so people have gotten over the years very uh, good in this, and they've gotten to kind of uh, relative uh, clock errors on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 8. However, there was a, a big uh, revolution when people realized that actually these mechanical systems, they run into some uh, limits, uh, most notably this kind of uh, mechanically uh, man-made objects, they have all imperfections, uh, but quantum systems can do actually much, much better. And so uh, atomic uh, clocks have really revolutionized uh, the idea of precision measurements in uh, timekeeping and have led to kind of uh, the most precise clocks now being on the order of about 10 to the minus 18 uh, relative errors or 10 to the minus uh, 20. And so uh, this is just to put things into uh, um, into uh, relation. So a modern atomic clock uh, would lose an accuracy of uh, less than 100 milliseconds over the age of the universe. And so this has led to obviously uh, uh, important uh, implications on uh, navigation, uh, notably GPS, synchronization of telecommunication uh, networks, but also tests of fundamental physics. And so what my group at U Chicago is asking is whether we can use kind of this high uh, precision of quantum measurements and use it to study and understand biological processes at the level of individual molecules and maybe learn something about aspects of biological processes that you wouldn't be able to study with conventional classical sensors. Well, yeah, that's what my uh, group is uh, interested in. And so uh, this is a very interdisciplinary approach that we are pursuing here. So on one hand, we are interested in understanding kind of the fundamental limits of uh, quantum sensors and experimentally how close can we uh, ever get to these uh, limits. And on the other hand, we need to identify biological targets and we need to be able to kind of interface uh, the two things. And so we use quite a bit of uh, technologies from the area of single molecule biophysics. And so this has over the last years in my lab uh, led to kind of uh, an array of uh, uh, different uh, research directions that we are pursuing. And just to main uh, some of them um, as an example, so we've been working on developing theoretical protocols to uh, use dipolar interactions in, uh, in, uh, in, in spin systems to create actually uh, non-classical states that could give you a metrological advance, um, advantage, and uh, we've investigated uh, how we can efficiently produce these states, and we've come up with a learning algorithm uh, to, to create them. Uh, but then we've also, on the other end, uh, started to work with a biotech company in Colorado that is using uh, uh, kind of that has developed a molecular biological assay to kind of screen for thousands of uh, different proteins in uh, human blood or urine, and they want to use this technology to learn something about your current state of health. And so we've together with them um, uh, started to uh, explore whether quantum technology could allow for the next generation of these kind of uh, diagnostic devices. Then I would say somewhere in between here is the search for uh, quantum sensors and quantum sensor bio interfaces that allow us to bring 
uh, very close uh, this uh, uh, qubit sensors, this highly sensitive qubit sensor uh, to an active, uh, uh, sorry, to an intact biological uh, molecule. And so that's really what I'd like to focus uh, during this uh, next, uh, I guess, this next uh, um, 30 minutes or so, next 40 minutes. And so let me maybe give a very brief overview, but I really don't need to spend time on here. So of course we are not using kind of these atomic clocks that I've shown before that people use for uh, timekeeping, but we use defects in uh, diamond nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, so all the work that I'm going to be showing is done at room temperature and is based on kind of uh, um, uh, spectroscopic techniques that have been developed in Stuttgart, Harvard, UCSB, and IBM, uh, kind of at the same time to perform high sensitive uh, magnetic field, electric field, and temperature measurements. So if anyone has a question about NV centers, that's the time to actually uh, ask now. Otherwise, I'm gonna uh, uh, move on, but I assume giving a talk at the uh, Adamas uh, Diamond uh, Seminar, uh, you guys are probably all familiar with this. Okay, so uh, uh, what does kind of this uh, nanoscale uh, NV centers really help us in uh, uh, for studying biological uh, uh, systems or processes. And I think kind of one uh, thing among many different applications, uh, many different interesting applications that people are pursuing is nanoscale NMR spectroscopy. So that was probably one of the first application that people were uh, proposing for bio applications uh, uh, when uh, NV centers were recognized as nanoscale uh, magnetic field sensor. And the idea here is the following. If you have a, a molecule, an individual uh, molecule, a biomolecule, and this has a uh, nuclear spins in it, these nuclear spins will create a magnetic stray field. And if you can bring a quantum sensor, a qubit sensor, close enough to this molecule, you can actually take advantage of the one over uh, R cube scaling uh, to actually still detect uh, fairly sizable magnetic fields with your uh, qubit sensor. And so the idea is that uh, doing that, we can perform spectroscopy on these nuclear spins and detect the spectroscopic signature with the NV center. So the idea is that uh, you can get kind of uh, uh, NMR uh, resonance uh, spectroscopy. So this is an ensemble measurement, not a single molecule, but uh, uh, it's kind of to illustrate the, the point that uh, different nuclear spins have different chemical shifts, uh, different J-coupling terms, and uh, you, you could detect that with a very local probe. Uh, and so uh, this idea is really kind of uh, taking advantage of the power of NMR spectroscopy. So NMR spectroscopy is this uh, powerful tool that chemists, biophysicists, biologists use almost on a daily basis that allows you to basically get uh, structural and dynamical information with atomic uh, resolution. And so it consists typically uh, of this kind of large uh, instrumentation with large magnetic fields. And the only real disadvantage of today's NMR spectroscopy, I would say, is that uh, uh, you, you're detecting nuclear spins with have, which have small gyromagnetic ratios. So you typically need macroscopic sized uh, volumes that are often not in a physiological environment. They are often kind of prepared as uh, proteins in kind of a, a buffer solution. And so typically you need something on the order of 10 to the 15 molecules to detect. So over the last 10, 15 years, uh, there has been a big push towards kind of uh, miniaturizing this technology to the point where we can detect small uh, ensembles or even potentially individual uh, molecules. And I would say by now, most people probably would agree that the technology that kind of has made the most rapid advances towards this miniaturization of NMR spectroscopy to the nanoscale length is um, diamond-based NMR uh, uh, NV spectroscopy. So uh, I think the consensus is still not in exactly what would be the most uh, exciting applications, but I'm giving here kind of my own take on uh, applications. And I think, if we can get to the regime of pico uh, later volumes and uh, mainly to micromolar uh, sensitivity, 
uh, we can probe small molecules and with that kind of uh, the contents of individual uh, cells and metabolic activities that could be interesting in kind of understanding uh, the function interaction and activities of individual cells in heterogeneous uh, tissues such as cancer. Then I think if we can get to the point where we can detect a small ensemble of biomolecules immobilized on a surface, we can uh, use this to perform molecular pull-down experiments and perform uh, animal spectroscopy in parallel where we detect many proteins uh, at the same time. This could be relevant, for example, for drug discovery. And then most uh, last but not least, I think uh, there are probably uh, quite a few exciting applications that we haven't thought about it at the moment. And that's maybe uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, exciting reasons why to do all of this. But I think these two applications will be already by their own interesting. So to give kind of a, a brief overview where the field currently is standing, I'm taking here just two examples work coming from um, Victor Acosta's lab in New Mexico or Michel and Michel Lukin's lab at Harvard. So what people have really been uh, focusing on so far on NV-based nanoscale animal spectroscopy is two directions. One is uh, increasing spectral resolution and uh, Victor Scope has really kind of been uh, among others leading this field. And uh, they've gotten to the point where we can get kind of uh, uh, subhertz uh, uh, spectral resolution. And if you combine that with a high magnetic field, this would be kind of close to be on par of a conventional animal uh, spectrometer. And the other kind of direction that people have been uh, pushing forward is the sensitivity limit. Basically, how many nuclear spins can we uh, detect what's the smallest number of nuclear spins we can detect. And I would say kind of a benchmark experiment here has been Michel Lukin's lab, where they've shown the detection of an individual ubiquitin protein that was labeled with uh, carbon-13 and uh, deuterium, and they've shown kind of a spectroscopic signature of this uh, 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 protein, of these nuclear spins in, in a protein. So it's about a few hundred nuclear spins that they've detected. So, uh, but from, from kind of uh, this point of uh, this proof of concept experiments to the point where we can really do spectroscopy on intact biomolecules is still a big step. Uh, some of these experiments are now actually fairly old, seven years ago, and we still uh, it's still an outstanding challenge to perform spectroscopy on intact biomolecules. And why is that? And I think one of the reasons, uh, there are several reasons, but I think one of the uh, main uh, uh, challenges is actually uh, that performing these kind of quantum measurements on uh, intact biomolecules is really difficult. And the reason is a, a biomolecule, a protein, is kind of a fragile uh, system. So uh, in Misha's lab, uh, in this kind of uh, milestone experiment, what they've done is they've uh, uh, kind of uh, dried ubiquitin proteins on a diamond surface and imaged it in oil. So it's a, a benchmark because they showed that NV sensing has the sensitivity to detect individual uh, proteins, but uh, uh, these proteins were actually kind of completely messed up, completely denatured. So it's kind of the same thing as you try to understand uh, the working mechanism of and structure of this fancy car, but all you do is you measure kind of this crashed, denatured uh, protein or car, and you say that there is uh, steel and plastic in, in the car. So it's great because we have the sensitivity, but uh, it's something we already knew. We knew that there is carbon and hydrogen in a, in a protein. So getting to the point of performing these measurements of on intact biomolecules is actually a big challenge. And uh, I think that kind of, uh, we can learn a lot from single molecule biophysics to create these interfaces of our sensors with intact biomolecules. And that was actually the first kind of project that my group attacked when we started at UChicago. And what we need to do here is we uh, need to create an interface where we can couple intact uh, molecules to a quantum sensor, uh, while not uh, messing up the structure and properties of these molecules, and at the same time, maintain the long coherence properties of uh, these qubit sensors. And so we are certainly not the first people attempting to do that. In fact, there is like a long history of people having tried to do that. And the problem really boils down that 
uh, the diamond surface chemistry is somewhat challenging here. So uh, while diamond can have many different surface termination, probably two of the most well-studied surface termination are hydrogen-terminated diamond and oxygen-terminated diamond. And they have actually advantages and disadvantages for different reasons. So hydrogen-terminated diamond, people have already 20 years ago uh, shown that you can uh, chemically uh, modify and actually covalently bind biomolecules to it. And uh, that these interfaces are highly stable, actually better than many of the other systems biophysicists uh, routinely use. But it comes at the uh, big disadvantage that NV centers lose their charge uh, stability. And basically then V qubit uh, changes from NV minus that has the interesting optical and uh, spin properties to NV zero that doesn't have interesting optical properties or addressability. Okay, so that rules kind of out uh, hydrogen terminated diamond uh, as an interface for uh, uh, bio quantum sensors. Uh, so what about oxygen termination, kind of the system that physicists have been using uh, uh, or the surface termination that has led to kind of uh, NV centers close to the surface with good spin coherence. And that's kind of the surfaces we've been over the last 10 years optimizing to get good spin coherence and good charge stability. But the problem with this is nobody uh, today knows how to uh, chemically modify these ether groups on, on the surface. So we really have here the problem that we can either have this uh, 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 very good surfaces for quantum measurements, but lousy surfaces for bio uh, functionality, or this uh, great surfaces for biofunctionality, but that are lousy as a quantum sensor. And so my group, uh, when I started uh, to look into this uh, problem, I said, okay, I'm not a material scientist. We are not going to try to mess around with the surface chemistry. People have tried that and with moderate success, and it has been moderately successful. Um, um, I think there are many challenges with this. So instead, what we do is we say, we take uh, these oxygen terminated diamond surfaces that we know have good spin coherence and we don't try to kind of uh, mess around with the surface termination uh, to attach uh, biomolecules to it but instead what we do is we deposit a very thin layer of aluminum oxide and this aluminum oxide can be grown with atomic layer deposition to one to two nanometer thickness and then we can use standard silanization techniques to kind of uh, carpet it with uh, a layer of uh, PEG molecules and use kind of standard single molecule uh, techniques from here. And so uh, these PEG molecules, they act as kind of a passivation layer to prevent non-specific binding of biomolecules to the diamond surface. But at the same time, we can actually dial in some uh, PEG molecules with functional groups that we then can uh, conjugate to, to biomolecules. And so, uh, here on the left hand side, you can see actually a fluorescent uh, image where each of these points corresponds to a fluorescent label of a, a, a dye labeled uh, protein. And as we increase the density of uh, binding sites, of active binding sites, we increase the absorption density of biomolecules to the surface. And so this project was kind of led by uh, my two students. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, Moza, is a postdoc, and uh, he actually is starting his uh, uh, faculty position uh, later this year. Uh, so I'll be looking actually for uh, uh, a new postdoc uh, since he is starting his own group very soon. So if you know of somebody looking for a postdoc position, please uh, uh, refer to me. Uh, so that's that's kind of great. We can show that uh, we can use this kind of surface modification to kind of attach biomolecules to the surface. Uh, but what about spin coherence? So the good thing is NV centers, they remain uh, photostable. So we can measure the same NV center before and after the surface uh, conjugation. And uh, we can measure the spin coherence. And that's what we've done here, actually. Uh, so we measure the spin contrast uh, for uh, the same NV center before and after the conjugation. And we find that um, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, CPMG uh, uh, decoupling, we get coherences that are very similar. We can do this a little bit more systematic. We can measure eight different NV centers before and after surface modification. 
we can actually uh, use noise correlation spectroscopy uh, to measure the distance to the surface to kind of proton spins on the surface. And by this, we can kind of map out where our NV centers are located at what depth. And we can measure, oh, this should not be spin contrast, but spin coherence. And we can measure the spin coherence before and after functionalization. And what we find is that most of the NV centers, except uh, one, they may Taint some uh, spin coherence. They take a little bit of a hit. The good thing is we actually know where the, uh, the coherence was coming from. It came actually from paramagnetic defects in the aluminum oxide. We by now switch to titania, and titania has the advantage that it uh, uh, has fewer paramagnetic defects. And in our most recent results, uh, these two points, they all lie on top of each other completely. Okay, so we can now having a spin coherence and fluorescence, we can translate this into a sensitivity in terms of nanotesla per square root hertz. And then assuming kind of the thickness of our functionalization layer, we can kind of uh, estimate how long we would need to integrate to detect kind of an individual uh, proton spin with an SNR of one for a five nanometer thick functionalization layer. And what we find is that all these NV centers lie somewhere between a thousand second integration to 10,000 second integration, which admittedly is kind of still on the long side, but uh, this is uh, using just dynamical decoupling uh, techniques with uh, correlation measurement. We can actually do quite a bit better using quantum logics and bring this maybe down by another uh, factor of uh, 10 to 100. And so uh, that's kind of great. That shows that we have uh, the spin coherence that is kind of relevant uh, in this experiment after uh, functionalization still. And then we can go a, a step further and kind of prove that uh, these molecules that we have on the surface are uh, indeed individual biomolecules. So we can take uh, a fluorescent image in a, in a microscope and we can take actually a movie, a stack of many, many images, and we can uh, track the fluorescence of an individual uh, fluorophore. And what we find is that the signal coming uh, from uh, one fluorophore, it kind of uh, uh, stays constant and then suddenly drops. And uh, this step uh, function is kind of the hallmark of an individual uh, biomolecule. Sometimes we can actually observe two molecules uh, together. So the good thing is that these are binary events. So we can start uh, performing statistics and we can find that about 90% of the immobilized uh, molecules were indeed individual uh, biomolecules. Then we can investigate kind of the uh, stability of our functionalization layer. We can perform over hours and days kind of this uh, uh, optical measurements. And what we find is that the densities of molecules goes down over time. And so we conclude from this that we get kind of on a time scale of a week uh, degradation of our uh, surface uh, functionalized layer. I think it's mainly due to degradation of the biomolecules and the fluorescence force itself, but it gives us a lo lower limit at least. So this is kind of uh, work that we've done and that is by now published in this PNAS paper I was referring to earlier. Uh, but now we would actually like to go a step further. So now that we have kind of this uh, interface between our quantum sensor and biological target, we would like to use this for something um, technologically and biologically meaningful. And so here we are actually working together with a, a company called Somalogics. And what they have done is uh, they've developed kind of these small DNA snippets that kind of tightly bind to um, proteins. And so uh, DNA has the advantage that you can kind of uh, use much easier uh, processes of evolution to kind of improve upon it. Uh, similar to how kind of the DNA vaccines were developed quite rapidly for uh, as a COVID vaccine. Uh, you can use this to develop kind of new types of antibodies in some sense, these aptamers. And uh, Somalogic has done this for 7,000 different target proteins. And uh, uh, we kind of uh, showed in my lab, or we are showing in the process of showing that we can use this as kind of a uh, a binding uh, site to immobilize uh, intact uh, proteins to the surface of our quantum sensors. And we've shown this kind of for two different uh, 
um, uh, for, for actually by now five different uh, proteins and we uh, can find that there is a, indeed uh, this chemistry still works on, on the diamond surface. So why would we like to do that? Um, if we can kind of um, immobilize biomolecules on a quantum sensor, we could maybe think about using the quantum sensor now to learn something about this protein. And that is kind of actually, uh, if you can do that in a high throughput, that could be really, really useful technologically uh, for human health. And the idea here is the following. Uh, our state of health, our uh, body is kind of the sum of uh, uh, the expression uh, of uh, 20,000 different type of proteins. And uh, so the pro understanding the proteome and knowing and monitoring the proteome provides much more information than the genome, for example. So uh, here I'm showing uh, this image of uh, all Schrödinger and child Schrödinger. They have exactly the same genome, uh, but obviously uh, they are very different people. So this guy knows something about quantum mechanics, where this guy probably doesn't know too much about quantum mechanics. And so the idea here is, is the following. If we can monitor uh, a person's proteome, uh, monitor the sum of all uh, protein over time, we can actually detect certain uh, diseases earlier than they would otherwise clinically manifest. So for example, a heart attack or a kidney problem. And at the same time, we could use this to uh, find maybe new pharmaceuticals because you can now study kind of uh, the interaction and modification and uh, expression level of, of proteins in a human body. However, the problem is there isn't really a, a technology comparable to what we have for genomics to understand the proteome. Uh, there are technologies out there, but they all have disadvantages. And so we've been working with this company uh, called Somalogics to kind of uh, use their biochemical assay and uh, investigate whether quantum sensors could be helpful here. So let me just in brief say how their technology works. So they uh, have these short DNA snippets that bind to uh, uh, target proteins. And then they use kind of, uh, uh, they detect the amount of this DNA snippets that they have in, in solution uh, with uh, a microarray to detect thousands of proteins at the same time, the expression level of thousands of proteins at the same time. The problem is to go from here to here, you need to get rid of non-specific binding events. And to do that, you have to go through quite a few steps of uh, washing, and that makes this technology actually somewhat cumbersome. Now, we've been discussing with Somalogics whether we could use, uh, uh, whether we could use uh, quantum sensors uh, located by these uh, stars here uh, to kind of uh, distinguish spectroscopically specific from non-specific binding event, from no binding event at all. And by doing that, we could hopefully uh, kind of rule out all the non-specific binding events and get a more a higher uh, reliability of our sensor, a higher fidelity. And so uh, we started kind of working with uh, Somalogic to kind of uh, perform proof of concept experiments using our surface modification uh, techniques uh, to detect uh, specific binding events of proteins on, on, on the surface. And so at the same time, my lab is uh, pushing forward uh, using our surface modification technique, integrate this into a high field NMR uh, spectrometer that goes up to 14 Tesla in the hope that we can both uh, increase sensitivity and spectral resolution to the regime where kind of molecular pull down could be uh, become a, a, a reality and uh, detecting small molecules in kind of um, metabolomic experiments. So just to give a, an idea here, I'm showing kind of the sensitivity of uh, different kind of sensors for NMR spectroscopy and the spectral resolution. Conventional NMR is kind of lying in this, uh, in this corner where we have enough spectral resolution typically, but not enough sensitivity to go to kind of single cell metabolomics or uh, detecting kind of uh, performing animal spectroscopy on um, uh, molecular pull-down uh, assays. 
versus a current NV experiment. So somewhere up here, they do have an increased sensitivity, but there is still uh, a way to go in spectral resolution in particular, and also a little bit in sensitivity. And the reason for this is that most of these experiments are done at fairly low magnetic field at hundreds of millitesla, uh, and with very few exceptions, uh, uh, things were done at uh, one to three tesla. But uh, to really go to a more, this more interesting biological regime, we need to go to 14 tesla. That's what uh, our lab at U Chicago is actually uh, uh, working towards. So now for the last kind of uh, uh, 10 minutes, let me switch gears a little bit. So far, we've been talking about quantum sensors as kind of a, a bulk uh, diamond and how we can interface this bulk diamond with intact biomolecules and what could be potential application. But uh, 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 it would be much, much cooler if we could use nanoscale uh, quantum sensor and bring them into a living cell and perform locally non-perturbatively our quantum measurements. And so, uh, that's uh, where Adamas comes into play. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, Adamas, among others, have kind of led uh, the development of uh, uh, nano diamonds that are small enough to be kind of gobbled up by intact uh, cells and that have a, a spin coherence that we can measure in this cell. The problem is that when you go from a bulk diamond to a nano diamond, typically coherence times go significantly down. Uh, typically to an order of a few microseconds. And so that is associated uh, with a lower sensitivity of our quantum sensor and kind of these hot quantum measurements uh, in bulk became um, even more challenging uh, if we want to work with a nanoparticle. So the good news is though that uh, we kind of understand where the noise is coming from in our nano diamonds. Uh, over the last few years, it has become uh, more and more clear that the noise is caused by uh, defects on the surface of the diamond. And so uh, you could now think about trying to make your diamond surface really pure, kind of removing uh, defects by chemically modifying. But uh, there is actually another approach to do this. And so this is an approach that has been very successful in nanotechnology. And that's by taking your uh, uh, nanoparticle and encapsulate it with an uh, inert shell that kind of improves and stabilizes the properties of your uh, particle. And so this has been done very successfully with quantum dots. So in quantum dots, this is not done for uh, spin coherence. This is not done for coherence uh, in terms of qubits, but it's rather done to improve the fluorescence properties of quantum dots. So uh, this is this famous experiment uh, by Bruce uh, from the 90s, where they've taken a kind of a bare quantum di uh, sorry, bare quantum dot, and you get this kind of blinking and quite bad optical properties. And as soon as you coat with a, a shell, you stabilize the fluorescent properties and you get quite stable uh, fluorescent. And this has really uh, made these technologies of qu uh, quantum dots from uh, curious uh, physical and uh, nanotechnological uh, system to something that has very direct applications in uh, consumer electronics, in single molecule biophysics, and uh, in, in biology as so a fluorescent label. Uh, similar kind of approach have been used more recently, not with quantum dots, but with rare earth stoke nanoparticles, where people improve the uh, optical properties of uh, lanthanides in um, oxides by using a shell. And so that has kind of really motivated us that maybe there is an idea to use uh, these shells uh, to now not improve the optical properties, but to improve the uh, spin properties of a quantum sensor. And so that's where we actually started with uh, uh, nano diamonds. So um, we've uh, taken these uh, nano diamonds from Adamas that are, uh, in this case, they were typically about uh, 70 nanometers in size. Uh, we first started to investigate what kind of paramagnetic defects we have in these diamonds. We've done a bulk EPR uh, spectroscopy on it, 
uh, you can decompose the EPR spectrum and you find that there is uh, a little bit of P1 defect, a little bit of H1 defects, which are kind of uh, vacancies associated with hydrogen, and a lot of uh, um, this S1 half defect uh, that we call, uh, that people have seen in the literature before, and they call this X defect. And people have kind of associated this with uh, dangling bonds and uh, surface defects of the nanodime. Uh, people know that they are surface defects because they scale as the area uh, as R square and not R cube. Okay. Uh, so, so far we've just kind of reproduced what people have already known uh, from bulk EPR spectroscopy. But now what we've did is we coated our uh, nanodiamonds uh, that we got from Adamas with a, a shell of silica. And what we found was a, a a uh, pretty surprising effect. We little bit reduced the concentration of uh, P1s, but we very significantly reduced the concentration of X defects. And so uh, 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 by about a factor of four. And so that was very encouraging. But again, it's kind of a bulk measurement. We just show that we reduce the total amount of uh, uh, X defects on the surface of uh, uh, these nanodiamonds, but uh, in these measurements, we don't show anything about spin coherence of our NV qubit sensor. So for that, we use optical techniques to kind of characterize the spin coherence of an NV center, first in bulk diamond. So here you can see a TM image, a false color TM image of a bare diamonds from uh, Adamas. And what we find is actually that on the dynamical decoupling, if we use uh, a large number of pi pulses, we can get actually sometimes very good spin coherences, um, 40 microseconds. And people have seen that before, by the way. Uh, but what people usually don't report when they publish their paper is that in 90% of the nanodiamonds that you perform these measurements, uh, you get very bad spin coherence. So each of these blue point is kind of the best spin coherence on the an optimization of number of dynamical decoupling uh, techniques. So each point is a different nanodiamond. Okay. So uh, uh, what we found is by systematically uh, performing our experiment is that there is this large spread of uh, spin properties in these nanodiamonds ranging from sometimes just a few microseconds to about 40 microseconds. Now, if we uh, use our uh, coat the nanoparticles, so yellow indicates the coat, uh, the silica shell. What we find is uh, that all our nanodiamonds uh, can take advantage of this full dynamical decoupling. And we uh, get out of this uh, coherence times that are on the order of uh, 60 microseconds. And so that's great. That already shows that uh, you improve uh, spin coherence and you make uh, originally kind of uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, spin properties, uh, very homogeneous. That's always good if you think about the application because you don't want to have to cherry pick the right diamond in a biological experiment because that's going to be a pain and not very scalable. Uh, but we can use actually now uh, 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 coherent control techniques to try to understand the properties of the spin bus a little bit better, the properties uh, of these uh, uh, surface spins. And so what we've done is we uh, performed kind of uh, uh, use dynamical decoupling to uh, probe the noise, the spin noise that the NV center sees in both uncoated and coated diamonds. In, and what we find is that for low frequency noise, uh, the core shell structures and the bare diamonds, they have almost the same kind of uh, uh, spectral properties in the noise. However, if we go uh, to high frequencies, if we probe high frequency noise, uh, uh, core shell structure significantly reduces the noise spectrum of the, uh, the 10 V center Cs. So that's, that's, that's great, great news. And we can now go even a step further and uh, probe kind of the uh, spin coherence of uh, uh, these NV centers over time. And so depending on the noise model, uh, kind of the contrast has a different uh, time dependence. And so 
what we were able to find is that for core shell particle, uh, this exponent follows roughly, uh, is roughly linear in time. And that corresponds to kind of a fixed configuration of spins on the surface. Whereas if you had spins on the surface that can come of hop around during your measurement, then this exponent changes from uh, being linear in T to uh, being a kind of a smaller, like a square root in T or something like that. And uh, that's indeed kind of one thing that we observed. There are also sometimes exponents that are larger and they could be explained by an auto model, by kind of a telegraph signal. So that's what we uh, were kind of able to learn about the material properties of this uh, bare diamonds and this coated core shell structure diamond through a quantum measurement. And so, yeah, with that, I think I'm at the end of uh, my time. Let me just wrap up. So uh, my research is located at the University of Chicago and uh, U Chicago is, is an amazing uh, place. Uh, uh, we are about 10 minutes from downtown Chicago. And uh, uh, my group is actually in the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering. It's the engineering department at U Chicago. And what I really like about the PME is that we kind of uh, combine uh, um, uh, a large number of uh, uh, top researchers in quantum engineering with immune engineering and materials and energy and water. And the type of research that we are doing at uh, the interface uh, of quantum and biosensing uh, really lives also at the interface of these three areas in, uh, in the PME. And with that, I'd like to make just one last advertisement. Uh, so at U Chicago, we recently got a uh, large NSF center, one of this uh, Quantum Leap Challenge Institute. And uh, our center is focusing on uh, developing new qubit sensors that we then can interface with biological targets You combined with uh, uh, new types of uh, uh, imaging technologies to uh, integrate in kind of uh, biological and medical uh, uh, devices. And that back informs kind of the requirements for a new qubit sensor. And so the team that works on this is uh, in our center um, is very interdisciplinary. We have about the equal number of biologists and physicians as we have physicists and quantum engineers. So with that, yeah, I uh, mentioned uh, my postdoc is starting his own faculty position uh, end of this year. And I'd be looking also for, for a postdoc if you have, uh, if you know of anyone uh, interested in kind of working at this interface of materials, uh, quantum technology and uh, bio. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. It's very exciting to see this um, your focus on NMR, very big advancement, uh, uh, and also bringing together different diamond platforms to, uh, that um, you can improve in terms of materials and sensing protocols. And also it's very impressive that you if you're able to engage with a company, it's not very often happens with academia groups, but this is uh, extremely impactful for outcome of academia results. So it's, uh, you have excellent portfolio of achievements. So, so we are open for questions who, who uh, would like to start with the first question. So maybe I will start. So, so, so definitely we are very interested in your work on nano diamonds. So my first question is, uh, so by putting silicon shell on diamond surface, you create larger distance between your analyte and your sensor. And we know that it one over R in cube. And uh, so uh, it, you improve sensitivity in terms of coherence time, but then you decrease it in terms of distance. What would be still kind of good enough distance uh, if, if there is optimal uh, situation when you still have a gain 
in yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, that, that's a very good question. So uh, uh, I think it really depends on the application. So for temperature sensing, um, the size is not as crucial as if you would want to perform uh, single molecule NMR spectroscopy, for example, because for temperature sensing, uh, the diamond is probably in thermal equilibrium with uh, whatever you want to sense, and typically gradients are not on uh, the uh, 10 nanometer uh, length scale. Uh, so I think for relaxometry, for EPR relaxometry, I think we can get away with uh, uh, a shell thickness of 10 nanometer. We should also keep in mind that these nanodiamonds that we are using uh, they turn out to be all about on the order of 70 nanometers. So if you have a 70 nanometer particle and you add 10 nanometer, it's maybe not as big of a, a problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I think an, an, another kind of direction that we would like to explore is uh, uh, how thin of a shell can we make to still benefit from this uh, improved spin coherence. We don't know the answer. So our model for what actually increases the spin coherence is, um, I left this out in interest of time, is that uh, the silica diamond interface leads to a band bending that depletes some of these uh, X spins. That's kind of our hypothesis. And it's uh, uh, the uh, that model is very consistent with kind of what we observe in increase in spin coherence, decrease in X spins, and uh, it's consistent also with kind of the pivot uh, uh, with the nitrogen doping of the diamonds that, that we have. Uh, so uh, there basically the question is, uh, could we get away with uh, a five nanometer thick uh, layer? Maybe, we don't know what, the, uh, what kind of the, uh, uh, um, a charge compensation layer is in, in the silica. But my guess is it's probably short. I think most of the charge is compensated relatively close to the surface. So maybe we could get away with a five nanometer thick or a, even a two nanometer thick layer, but it's something we haven't explored yet. And uh, we had a question from Marka on what sized particles we were at the last several slides on. So I assume it's 17 nanometers, right? Yeah, so this is a, a very good question. Uh, so we started actually with particles that were uh, 40 nanometer nominally that we purchased from Adamas. Uh, and uh, not all the diamonds, we, we were aware not all of the diamonds uh, had kind of good spin coherence. So once we picked for the ones that had good coherence and did afterwards, uh, electron microscopy correlation to know how big the particles actually were. It turned out that all the one, all the nanodiamonds that had good spin coherence, they were all 70 nanometer in size. So uh, we were kind of uh, getting biased in our quantum measurements by picking diamonds that had good spin coherence or adequate spin coherence to see good at least see a good ODM more. They all tended to be on the order of 70 nanometer. And I think actually that's something that has been kind of plaguing the field uh, quite a bit that uh, when people report spin coherence in particles, I think they get actually biased to uh, fairly large uh, diamonds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, uh, I have another question. Uh, how much uh, might environment influence this T2. For example, if you do measurement in water where, where a lot of this, say, hydrogen spins around uh, versus some aprotic solvent or even in air. Uh, pr probably you do in air uh, measurements, right? Single particles distributed over, um, say, glass substrates and you measure T2. But what if you would have, say, water around or some aprotic solvent? If any yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so even in air, you're going to have uh, a few layers of water, right? That's just from moisture in, 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 in the atmosphere. So what we found is, at least for this nanodiamond, we were not limited by nuclear spin noise. We were limited by these X spins. Uh, mm -hmm. So when we decoupled these X spins or 
uh, depleted them, we increased the, the spin coherence. Uh, nuclear spins, you can actually fairly well dynamical uh, decouple away because mm -hmm. they tend to have fairly narrow uh, lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're raising another uh, good question, right? That is, uh, if you want to perform NMR spectroscopy on biomolecules and you want to detect protons, you better work in a deuterated environment uh, to not have too much auto background. Mm -hmm. Hey, Peter, can you uh, hear me all right? Might be easier I to ask. Me other hear you well. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks. This is a, a really fantastic talk. Um, but just to follow up on what you had just um, mentioned regarding particle sizes. So after your SiO2 coding, um, you know, most of the particles seem to respond better to this, you know, increased pi pulsing. Yet you still have a pretty a reasonable distribution of T2 times. So based off of um, kind of what you're observing about, is do you think this is a geometric effect or are you able to correlate, you know, okay, where is this distribution still coming from? Because it implies that it is still either maybe like a surface to size ratio, because I know that because they're not spherical. Um, and so I'm wondering if they're, you're actually able to particle by particle still correlate this to some other parameter. Yeah, yeah it's it's a good question. And uh, uh, we have not tried to kind of correlate to uh, particle shape or um, we, we've correlated to size and all of these uh, particles, uh, we for each batch for the coated and uncoated, we correlated four particles, and all mm -hmm. of them were pretty narrow, around 70 nanometer in size, actually. Uh, but we haven't correlated to kind of uh, shape or anything like this. It's also a little bit a question where then V centers. So these are multiple NV centers, right? Mm, um, true, true. Diamond, many NV centers how they are exactly distributed with regards to the surface or maybe also with regards to P1 centers. Uh, uh, the problem is these measurements, they tend to be actually fairly time consuming for us, especially if we do TM correlation. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing, but I think it could also be very quickly, very challenging. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Peter, I am curious uh, how you established collaborations with uh, SOMA logics. Uh, it probably would be uh, interesting for other academic groups also. Who approached whom? Yeah, uh, so I mean, this went around a couple of corners. So uh, uh, this was a response to an NSF call uh, to one of these convergence accelerators. And uh, uh, Soma Logic and uh, Anya Church, they had uh, a collaboration, have had a collaboration over 10 years. Actually, the C2 at Soma Logic, he was developing uh, AFMs before. And so uh, from that side, from the AFM side, they had a collaboration with Anya Church at uh, Santa Barbara. And so uh, Anya about the new work that they want to do at Soma Logic, that he wanted to do at Soma Logic, and that how this entire thing uh, kind of started as a, as a response to this uh, NSF uh, call. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So government helps to bridge academia. And... Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other thing is, uh, uh, which is maybe not as relevant here for the collaboration with Soma Logic, but uh, is certain, I know it's actually also uh, relevant here to the collaboration with Soma Logic. I think there are just certain things that you can't develop in academia, but that industry is really good in. Uh, uh, engineering a better cost, for example. Um, in academia, you always need this novelty factor uh, to publish a paper. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's maybe not the, the most important thing, sometimes you may just need a better way to separate particles or, uh, uh, and these things take time and they are challenging uh, too. And I think that's where, academ uh, where industry could really benefit to acad for academic. But I think the other way around, I see us as academic group, uh, we de-risk some uh, projects for industry. So my logic, uh, they 
they have the working assay, this, mole uh, this uh, molecular biological assays, and they are selling this service to companies like uh, uh, Novartis or so, the big pharma companies. Uh, but they would be interested in exploring, they, they are interested in also knowing whether quantum technology could ever be useful here. And so if there is a, if there are research labs that have research grants to do some proof of concept experiment, it's a way for them to stay connected to the field and uh, be the first one to jump onto a, a new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And I have the very last question. I don't know if somebody else have any questions, please step in any time. So for nanoparticles, you envision still application in nano NMR when you can deliver particles to site of interest and take this local NMR still. So what is your vision for how are you going to use your particles with improved um, uh, coherence. Yeah. Uh, so I, th I think for these nanoparticles, we are actually more envisioning first application on kind of temperature sensing. Mm. I think animal spectroscopy, diamond based animal spectroscopy by itself is already really challenging. And I think, uh, bulk diamond need to lead the way here. Uh, but I think another kind of application could be for relaxometry for kind of detecting paramagnetic species uh, in molecules, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Uh, my group also started recently work on molecular qubits for sensors. And I think that could be interesting for EPR spectroscopy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think animal is just compared to EPR, uh, the relaxometry, uh, just really hard. And I think we first need to work things out on bulk diamond before Mm -hmm. attacking nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, oh, uh, I'm sorry, it's one more question. Uh, so in terms of mechanical stability of silica shells, so uh, uh, how long mechanically stable it is? Uh, so the short answer is we don't know exactly. We've never mm -hmm. uh, probed it. Uh, we tend to create the shell, uh, core shell structures and then characterize them pretty much uh, immediately in the next days. My guess is the silica will uh, degrade over time, that it undergoes uh, hydrolysis and decompose over time. But I don't know how, uh, how, how, how fast this effect takes place and degrades mm -hmm. the coherence. We, we just haven't studied it systematically. Mm -hmm. I, I think reviewers of your manuscript uh, can ask this question. Oh yeah, def definitely. Mm -hmm. So probably you, you will need such experiment on stability of silica shell over time. Yeah, these things are much easier to study with uh, uh, for kind of a, a layer of silica on bulk diamond or alumina on bulk diamond because you can look at the same region multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, with nano diamonds, we find it just to be quite a bit harder. Uh, but yeah, no, definitely it's uh, something we should address. We haven't addressed it in our draft, so thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one step at a time. Yeah. Um, I have one, one question. Um, when you do your silica core shell coating, uh, I, I see in the SEM it looks pretty much like all of the shells are on the diamonds, but do you have any like free silica formed? Um, and the reason I ask is because when you do the EPR, uh, if you had free silica as a mass percent of your sample, uh, it's going to affect the uh, amounts of spins that you're measuring relative to the starting, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we haven't uh, seen significant amount of uh, free silica. Um, mm. uh, having that said, uh, when we did the EPR spectroscopy, the way we kind of normalized it is we take the bare diamonds, uh, we perform EPR, and then we lyophilize the sample and we measure how much uh, diamond we had in it. Uh, for the core shell structure particle, we uh, actually dissolve the silica first. 
we removed the helicopter the EPR measurement uh, in KOH and uh, then we measure again the particle weight we we wash it and lyophilize and measure the particle weight mm, okay so uh, this 3.8, you bring up a good point, Nicholas, this 3.8 is in that sense kind of an upper limit of the expense. Mm -hmm. and, and so do I understand? So once you uh, dissolve the silica layer in KOH, does it, it returns to the original or, or close to the original? Um, so I'm understanding oh, the way you're saying, so you measure, measure the barrier. We, we haven't yeah. measured the spin coherence uh, after dissolving the... Uh, uh, silica way. Uh, that's oh, actually I mean just the. Problem. I mean just the EPR spectrum. So I so you would measure the bare particles, oh, measure absolutely. the silica coated, redissolve the silica, and then measure the bare measure the again. Does it well, like the yeah, signal? Yeah, we haven't measured the silica uh, the bare particle after dissolving the silica either. It, it it's mm. a good idea. We we haven't done it. Uh, we should have done it in hindsight. <laughs> I didn't think mm. of it. it. It it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so it was a lot of questions, great presentation. So, Peter, uh, thank you so much. It was uh, amazing presentation. Great, thank you for uh, organizing this all, Olga. Mm -hmm. Okay, at this point, we adjourn for today. See everybody in a month or in two months. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye.